So it starts with discovery, right? The first thing we look at is how do people discover your brand? How do they find out about you? And this is where most, uh, when you look at private label, it tends to be, I'm going to the store for something and I see the two products by, side by side. This one's a little le less expensive, so I buy it, right? And that's been the way it's worked for many, many years. But the thing is, there's ways to do more than that today and be more effective at it, right? The next thing is, once they've discovered, how are they activating? How are they engaging? What kind of conversations are they having in social media? What are they telling to their friends? So when someone actually has that experience, what does that engagement look like? So that's the activation. That, of course, leads to transactions. But this is where most businesses stop. And this is where, again, if you look at what happens after transactions, this is where all the value comes. And that's active, uh, advocate, uh, advocacy. Advocacy is the difference between someone buying your product once and someone becoming a raving fan of your product and helping to get you more customers. See, Peter Drucker used to say that the purpose of business was to get customers. But today, the purpose of business is to get customers to get you more customers, right? That's advocacy. So we're gonna spend a lot of time today talking about advocacy, but this whole customer journey mapping, it's gonna be different for different customers. So you have different people using your products, and so you need to think about it not just in the context of one ideal customer, but the, the, the two or three that are sort of driving your business and driving your volume. So in each, as we're discussing this, it's not gonna be the same answer for everybody. It's gonna be slightly different, right? So, designing exceptional experiences. We have something we call heart, uh, head, heart, hands, right? So the idea is you first have to win people's heart, emotionally connecting with them, before they'll intellectually under, start talking and thinking about your brand, then their actual hands will actually move to buy the product, right? So head, heart, hands. How are you emotionally connecting with your customers? How are you getting to think about your brands? And then how are you making them take some action? And that action doesn't always necessarily mean transaction. It could be they're leaving a review or they're talking about your products. There's all kinds of actions that they can take, but they're never gonna do it until they have an emotional connection and understand what you're doing, what you're all about, right? So the relationship in this journey mapping has changed because the path to purchase is no longer this linear thing. It used to be like, you know, we, we, we connect here and we buy here and everything in between is pretty, pretty straightforward, right? In 1950, Tide could say, you know what? Go buy Tide, we're the best brand, that's it. They'd walk in the store, they'd buy it, that's it, right? Now, you look at the, the multitude of devices. People are engaging with brands everywhere. They're taking it on their mobile phones, right? And then they're actually going online to do some research. They're doing some searches. Then they're actually talking to their friends in social media. Then they're basically going around and finding out what are other people saying about you. They're understanding those pieces and making purchasing decisions. So that has sort of changed the landscape of how we're engaging now with customers. But why does it matter, right? Experience matters because it, customer experience leaders obtain returns of 77% greater than their marketing investments than those who give uh, little importance to the overall market approach, right? So if you're transactionally focused, then you're considered down here a customer uh, uh, experience laggard. But if you're out there in front and you're doing a lot of these things ahead of time, you have a massive gap. And this is where you're getting the biggest return on your marketing investments, right? So it's, it's not a small difference. It's 77%. It's huge. But less than 30% of companies have even mapped their customer journey. Less than 30%. So when I ask who, who here has mapped their customer journey, it's not surprising. I expect it to be very low, maybe one or two people max in a conference room this size, because the vast, the vast majority of people are focusing elsewhere. But the return on that investment is so much higher. So when you look exactly what your customers need and what they want from you, this is where you can really start to drive high levels of engagement and higher returns. Um, from a customer behavior perspective, 93% of people use search engines to find out about products and services. So one of the first things they're gonna find out is, what do they know about it? So if you're creating your own brand within your retail category, the first thing they're gonna do is they're gonna do a Google search and say, what can they find out about you? Now, if you've put no content into the marketplace, what are they gonna find? What everybody else says about you. So you're not even the part of the conversation, right? So essentially, you better hope that your customers like your brand and that they're talking positively about you because if they're not, then the thing they're gonna find is whatever people are saying because you are not part of that conversation. 88% look at social channels to form their opinion. So they're saying, hey, has anybody ever used the, uh, Archer Farms? Anyone like Archer Farms? What do you guys think about that? People have those conversations through social media all the time. But what's great about it is oftentimes those are public conversations, which means other people get to view them. So for example, on Twitter, that Twitter feed lasts forever, right? So if someone does a Google search and they find it, the, the actual Twitter, the tweet itself can be found and indexed and people will click on that link. 
which is this long tail conversation, which is great. So if people are blogging about your pro products and services, that's stuff that people will find through search engines, but they'll also be referenced in social media. So when people are asking, what do you think? They're gonna point back to those, those points. 70% um, uh, cite consumer opinion as the most trusted source of information. So it's something like 96% of people don't trust advertising, but you know, it'd be somewhere between 70 and 80%, depending on who you're listening to, trust their friends to tell them sort of what they should buy, right? So that's part of that conversation. That's why discovery is so important. It's not necessarily just because someone hates your product, it's not the end of the world. It's more a matter of what's that feedback loop? What are you doing with that information? Was it an isolated incident or is this really a problem that we have with our product? and we gotta do something about it. If you then do make changes and you go back to that customer and say, we're really sorry you had that experience. We just, we just based on your feedback, here are the changes we made. I'd like you to see if you try it again. You just turn a negative into an explosive positive because what happens is, now that you actually listen to me, they're gonna tell everybody, it's like, just because I made this review, look at what the changes that were made. So for example, um, my Starbucks idea, right? Starbucks came out and they basically said, you know what, we're in social media, but we wanna to listen to our customers better. What can we do? So they basically said, instead of telling everybody how great Starbucks is, we're gonna basically say, how do you make it better? And so my Starbucks idea was a simple forum where people could go in and say, I know that I like going to Starbucks, but there are certain things I'd like to see different. That's why we have free Wi-Fi at Starbucks. That was a consumer idea. You know those little green things you put in the top of your coffee cup so it doesn't spill over? Another consumer idea. Someone said, I love Starbucks, but when I'm carrying a, 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 play, a pallet of, of coffees back up to my office, they slosh around when I'm walking around. I really hate to, I'd like to solve that problem. So they created that little stir that plugs it up, but that was a consumer idea. But then that makes raving fans because then people are it's like, hey, these guys listen to me, and now I'm gonna basically support them even more. See, so that, that's the discovery cycle that continues to push out, right? So we've talked about discovery. Hopefully this is the first thing you understand. This is the most important. If people can't discover your brand, they're not going to engage with them. So this next part doesn't even matter if they can't even discover you. But assuming that you've taken some action on discovery, then we move into activation. So this is the interesting thing about Trader Joe's, right? I'm sort of jumping up a little bit ahead here. But they, they've actually capitalized on market trends such as better for you and healthier for you options by listening and engaging with their core customers and getting ahead of demand. So what's interesting about who's crushing it in private label, you know, Trader Joe's is crushing it, but it's not for the reasons you might think. It's not about just sort of like having the availability inside their stores. They're actually actively talking to their customers, both physically and online, right? So when they're actually talking to customers inside of Trader Joe's, they're asking questions. What are you looking for? What do we not have here that we should have? What are ways we can improve our store? And they're feeding that back to corporate. The flip of that side is they're also doing a lot of work in terms of social media and they're saying, what are people asking about in terms of you know, GMO? What are people talking about in terms of gluten-free? You know, what are those trends and what should we be paying attention to? And then they take that back to their sort of team and they say, okay, this is what we're looking for and these are the products we're looking to, to, to invest more in. And because of that, they're really doing a great job of connecting with their customers on a regular basis. Twix, for example, has a great job on the candy side of engaging with customers. They have fun tweets like this one that says, you know, if, uh, if a Twix bar uh, is, breaks in a, in a forest, you know, does it still sound delicious, right? Just having some fun like that. So something like that, you're like, well, that's nonsense. Why, why would that matter? Because it's funny and it's humorous and it gets people to smile, right? And if you've read uh, Gary Vaynerchuk's Jab, 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 Right Hook, great book on social media, fantastic, right? This is a jab, right? It's not a sale. No one's pushing you to buy something. They're just reminding you that it's a cool brand and you should, you should have that sort of association with that. One of the most brilliant campaigns was the Super Bowl 2013. Oreo dunking in the dark, do you remember this? I mean, <laughs> amazing, right? So Oreo was smart enough to have their social media team on point, right, during the Super Bowl. They were looking for opportunities to sort of engage with their customers. And when the, when the power went down in 2013, it was seconds later, they posted and said, that's okay, you can still dunk in the dark. It was brilliant. Millions and millions and millions of retweets. This, 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 you can't buy this kind of exposure. They had better branding from this tweet than their Super Bowl commercials, right? It's because they were there, they were sort of in the conversation. And it's that kind of stuff that basically helps drive that brand. When people get hung up is they're focusing on tweets and they're focusing on likes and they're focusing on sort of you know retweets and engagements and all that stuff, but none of that drives to sales, right? So one of the challenges is when, when your only metrics are basically engagement metrics, it's not far enough. 
Now, you're basically getting a good litmus test of sort of how things are working and how people are engaging with you, but you gotta take it at next level. So as I was mentioning in the very beginning of my session, um, I've got a ebook called The ROI of Social Media, right? It basically breaks down how do you track and measure the, uh, the ROI of your social campaigns. If you go to twitter.com slash billcarmody, you can download it for free. There's no registration or anything, you just pull it down. But the reason I'm showing that is because people are often not focusing on the right ways to measure the effectiveness of their social media campaigns. Because this does, in fact, build a transaction. And if you've done your job in the discovery and the activation stage, then you're going to get to transactions. And from transactions, this is where we are measuring the right things. The right things are your sales, how you have a direct correlation between the activities you're doing in social media and your sales. Coupons and, and uh, codes redeemed, right? Um, loyalty program registrations, you know, rebates, proof of purchase. There's all kinds of traditional tactics that you can weave in to your social media campaigns so you can get the ROI of it, right? Customers spend average 23% more when they have established emotional connection with the brand than customers that do not. So if you actually look at people who are actively engaged versus those who are not, the people who are actively engaged spend more, right? And we look at blending of this tried and true tactics. The average redemption rate for a coupon is somewhere between 1 and 10%, right? That's what we see for the FSIs and things of that nature. You're all used to that. We're getting 68% when we do a social media campaign with a coupon. 68% redemption. It's insane. <laughs> but why? Because people are engaged and people are actively asking for it and we're doing it in creative and interesting ways. And so when people actually get that coupon, it's just not another coupon they stick in their wallet. It's something that they had fun with and they, there's a memorable aspect to it. So getting a 68% redemption rate is not unheard of. We're seeing this all the time with a lot of our customers. <clears throat> Remember the Coke, Share Coke program? Oh yeah. Oh my God. This was so brilliant because it started out in social media, only in social media, right? They didn't do any television advertisement, they didn't do any billboards, not when they started. When they started, they just changed the packaging and told people online, it's like, hey, if you take a picture with your friend, we're gonna retweet it. That's it, that's all they did, right? Massive success. So much so that what ended up happening is they had these viral videos that they didn't even create. See, the thing is, when you create a good campaign, you have to let it go. <laughs> because you don't own it, right? And when they had a couple that basically talked about being pregnant on YouTube using Coke cans, they were announcing their pregnancy to the world using Coke cans. Like, that's when you know you've hit it, right? And that's the whole point. That, that transaction just continues to feed upon itself because as more and more people were playing with this, they were using it. And see, the thing is, it wasn't, they didn't even use a coupon for this. All they did is change their packaging. Can you guys change your packaging? You know, so that's the thing, it's like, what can you learn from these brands and say, what simple things can I do that will dramatically change my sales for my business, right? So now, I'm gonna tell you the most important thing from this session is advocacy. What you need to learn, if nothing else you take away from this customer journey mapping, is the last mile is what even the national brands are not doing a great job of. Coke is doing a great job, but most are not, right? Coke started with My Coke Rewards. Right? My Coke Rewards was just having those little codes underneath the cap, very, very simple thing. They created their own currency. Now you're just like, well, we have this loyalty program, we, you know, all, our, all our shoppers have shopper cards, right? But what are they doing with it? You know, you're tracking all their data, they're getting discounts on the receipt, it tells you how much money they've saved. What else? Some people are giving them free gas. Okay, great. Coke has built a machine behind their My Coke Rewards program, so much so that other brands are buying My Coke Rewards points to put, to, to put inside of their packages. Like, oh, that's crazy. Like, why would you promote Coke? Well, that's because it's such a popular back-end campaign. And that's what I'm getting at, is that advocacy happens when you start to build that sort of head of steam. So how do you create raving fans? That's the question of the day, right? I'm not talking about a casual buyer, but how do you get people to love this brand, right? And you can see this in Archer Farms. You know, when people are, I go back to Target because people are naturally passionate about when they're shopping at Target, just as part of their culture and their DNA. But even simple things like Archer Farms, you look at what people are saying about them and they're talking about it online. This is unprompted. Uh, you know, Target's not doing anything with this. But what's great about it is people enjoy the product. Trader Joe's, another one, raving fans. People are like, oh, I can't wait for my JoJo's. You know, they're just like, it's amazing, right? And these raving fans sort of get you more customers. And then people are saying, you know what? I took those holiday, uh, you know, uh, was it the uh, mint, you know, cookies from Trader Joe's, and then I, I dipped them in chocolate with my fondue set, and now I create these chocolate Jojo's. You can try that. They're amazing, right? Raving fans. These are people that are taking the, these products, they're doing things with it, making them their own, and telling their friends about it, right? That's how you get more buyers, right? You, when, when somebody sees something like that, they're like, that's really cool. I should try that. And they'll go out and they'll buy it, and they'll try the, try the recipe. 
Now, the big piece of this I want to tell you is a lot of people are looking at me like, oh God, I don't have another thing to do. I can't imagine like, you know, doing a whole social media campaign and it's like, you know, time and money and blah, blah, blah. I get you, I hear you, right? I've been doing social media campaigns since 2008. So for the last eight years, I've watched this arc. And you know, there's just a lot of bad crap out there, right? So from a content perspective, there's a lot of ways to get this wrong. So I'm pleased to tell you that there's alternatives to just going out and building Facebook pages and Twitter pages and Pinterest pages and all that kind of stuff. Influencer marketing is your answer. Um, anyone who wants to give me their card after the session, I will send you the Nielsen Catalina uh, White Wave study which talks about sort of how White Wave has tested out all their various different digital media campaigns, and, then, and this was just released this week. The number one thing that they've found to be most effective is their influencer marketing campaigns. Because for every thousand impressions they get through influencer marketing, I'm gonna explain what that is in a second, they're getting $285 of incremental sales. That's sales at physical retail. Right? So what's interesting, when people talk about sort of the ROI of social, this is a great example. And you see the difference between sort of the best banner ads, the, the, the average banner ads at White Waves gives you about $2. So for every thousand impressions, they get about $2 worth of sales. And the best campaigns they've ever done with banner ads gave them about $4, right? This campaign, $23. I mean, orders of magnitude different, like 11X over every other digital campaign strategy they've used. Why? Influencer marketing is tapping into people who already are doing things in social media. You don't have to go build all your audiences. You don't have to go create all these faith, these blog posts and, and pages and all that stuff because there are people who are already raving fans about whatever products you're selling, right? And what's interesting about sort of what influencers do is you set up a campaign and typically it's about three months. But when you do a three month banner ad campaign or a search engine marketing campaign or a paid Facebook campaign, what happens when you stop paying for the media? It's over, it's done. There's no more advertising, it's, that's how it works, right? With influencer marketing, you're actually hiring influencers to post content on their blogs and in social media, and guess what? It doesn't go away. So after three months when the campaign ends, it's still working. And this is what Whiteley found 12 months later. They're still getting sales off of posts that were happening 12 months ago. Now, this is the difference between influencer marketing and every type of other digital marketing out there. With influencer marketing, you're not controlling the content. You're providing assets. Here's our product shots. Here's some pictures we like. Here's some, here's some video content. Here's some interesting things we like, think you should be able to use, right? You're handing over the content. And you're not paying for distribution. So what influencers do is they take that content and they put it in their own voice. These are mommy bloggers, right? Who would love to get paid for blogging, but they don't. So the thing is, it's fairly cheap to be able to hire these mommy bloggers, even when they have, whether it's you know, 500 followers or 500,000 followers or 5 million followers. It doesn't matter because these, these, these folks want to monetize the great work that they're doing. And you guys provide that vehicle from basically at scale. So you're not hiring one or two influencers, you're hiring hundreds of influencers at scale. Does that make sense?